Welcome back everybody and today we're going to be looking at protein synthesis. Specifically what we're going to do is break it down into two different videos. This one is going to focus in on our transcription and essentially what transcription uh, means is to copy or to write down and so what we're doing is we are taking our DNA code and we are going to copy down a recipe, if you will, on how to make a certain protein. Now, I just want to remind everybody that this process of making proteins is um, specific to what we need. And your DNA is very similar to a recipe book. And like any recipe book, you have many different kinds of dishes that you can make. Now, for example, if we wanted to make dessert or uh, some kind of dessert, we wouldn't need to make all the fish and meat dishes first, we would go directly to the page that has the dessert that we want on it and it has the ingredients and the method. And we would follow all those things and we would produce the dessert that we wanted. And it's the same with protein synthesis. Now, protein synthesis is only possible because we take our DNA strand and we convert it into a type of RNA, which we call messenger RNA. And I'll explain a little bit more detail uh, later on in the video. There is also something called tRNA or transfer RNA and finally ribosomal or rRNA. Each one of these types of RNA have some specific purpose in the actual creation of a protein. So where does this all happen and how does transcription result in a protein? So let's just not forget that our chromosomes essentially are made up of DNA that has been densely wound and condensed. And when we want to make a protein, we are going to read a specific gene. And you have thousands of genes that code for different proteins, and each of those proteins in turn can be used to build larger structures. Essentially, genes are sections of DNA that code for different traits or characteristics. So now what we need to do is we need to be able to read the DNA. And we already know that the DNA is written in four letters. It is written as A, T, G, and C. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. But these letters don't mean anything unless they are put in a certain order and they are read and therefore transcribed in a certain order and then translated into a protein at a different stage. Now let's look at the steps that are taken to transcribe a piece of DNA. Now because we don't need the entire piece of DNA, we're only going to unzip and unwind the section of DNA that we want to transcribe or in other words, this gene that we want to transcribe for or trait. So alongside, I have drawn a piece of DNA and you will notice that a section of it has straightened out, it's unwound, and the hydrogen bonds that are gonna run down the middle here that hold the nucleotides together have separated and they're going to break apart. And that's because we need to get into the lettering, we need to get into those nucleotides and we need to be able to read them. If we don't separate them, we won't be able to read the code. So who does all the reading of this particular code? Well, that's up to enzymes. Now that we've unwound the section that we want to transcribe, we now need to use it as a template. And it's important to note that only one side of the DNA is used as a template. For example, on my little sketch here, that means that only this side of our DNA is the side that we want to copy. And so we don't copy both sides of the DNA strand, we only copy one side. Now the proteins that are responsible for coordinating the whole transcription process are going to read the code three letters at a time. And if we have a look at the diagram here, when we refer to these three letters, 
we call them triplets or base triplets in DNA. And so what we do is we take these three letters, in this instance it's C-A-T, and we are going to copy them. But we cannot copy them directly. Instead, we have to use their complementary base pairs. And so we form something called a codon. A codon is complementary to its triplet. And so that means that if the triplet, like in this instance, is C-A-T, its complementary side will be G. U, A. Now, I know you're asking yourself, but where did this U come from? Because generally, adenine, A, joins with thymine. Well, now that's the difference in RNA molecules. In RNA, A will always join to U, which is known as uracil. However, this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because if the code has a T in it, which is thymine, thymine still joins to adenine. And so if we were making an mRNA piece, we would still have the letter A. And so this sometimes makes people slip up because they're uncertain of who joins with what. But in the next slide, I'm going to do a little example so you can do one too and you can work out what exactly would be the complementary base pairs that match. Now we take all of these codons, and as you can see, there are many that are making up this particular strand in the diagram, and we now have formed a piece of mRNA, also known as messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA carries the message of what we want to copy. So where did these uh, mRNA nucleotides come from? Well, they are called RNA nucleotides, and they are freely floating and available in the nucleus itself, and they find their complementary base pair. Now, before we finish this process up, we must also note that the DNA does not just stay unwound and unzipped when it's not being used. So when we're done copying down the necessary codons for the mRNA, the DNA strand will wind back up again and it will rezip because we want to preserve the nucleotides and we don't want to be losing any of them or deleting them because this can result in mutations. And mutations ultimately result in different proteins being created. So now we have a piece of mRNA. And as we can see in the diagram here, just to reiterate that and to go over the lettering, we need to remind ourselves of who joins with which complementary base pair. And so what we've done here is we are copying this top strand over here. And so you will see that the complementary base pairs include only the letter U. And so if we were to write this out, you will see that A joins with U, no longer anymore, the letter T. But now you see the letter thymine. Now, thymine still joins with A. And so when you actually write the genetic code for the mRNA, you should never see any letter Ts. If you have, it means you've done the process incorrectly. Luckily, the letter G, which is for guanine, still joins with cytosine, and so on and so forth. Now, this piece of mRNA that we have now made, and that is complementary to the DNA, now needs to leave the nucleus. Now, the nucleus itself, if we were to do it a little sketch here, has a membrane. And the membrane has these little openings in them, which we call nuclear pores. And this is exactly where our mRNA is going to leave the nucleus from. And essentially, it's going to leave the nucleus, and its next destination is our final destination, which is called a ribosome. A ribosome is the organelle that is responsible for protein synthesis, and it is the ultimate destination for the mRNA molecule. Now let's do a quick recap of today's terminology. So first of all, we looked at transcription. Transcription is when we take the genetic code, we unwind it, we unzip it, and we copy a section of it in order to make a protein. Now we don't copy the entire section, we only copy out smaller sections called genes.
and the ultimate product of transcription are mRNA molecules or messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA reads the DNA triplets, which are the letters A, T, G, and C, and they form what we call codons, which are sets of three letters, keeping in mind that now when we make mRNA, A now joins with U. Let's not forget then that uracil is taking the place of thymine. Then there is something called tRNA, which I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, but we need to understand what it is in the, in the next video in relation to translation, which is the second stage of protein synthesis. And last but not least, the ribosome. The ribosome is where we're actually going to produce the proteins. And so we've now spoken about copying the genetic code in the nucleus. We've moved into the cytoplasm, and now we are going to go to the ribosome essentially the protein factory. It's so important to have good terminology and to understand how to use these words correctly. So make sure you go through them, keep reference of them. And I'm going to then set up another video explaining translation. So go and have a look at that. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.